Hello, physics team. Hope you're doing all right today. I would like for us to think a little bit about slopes. And you've been around the world of physics long enough by now to know that slope of a graph is one of the most important things that we ever think about. And if we're talking about the slope of a straight line, okay, we've had the tools to do that for a long, long, long time. We you know, pick two points on the graph and we, from one point to the other point, how far up do we go? How far over do we go? Divide. And we also know like for, say, there's a position versus time graph uh, on your screen right now, um, the slope of that position versus time graph means something to us in terms of physics because we're looking at a change in position for every one unit of our change in time how many meters, for example, for every one second, which we call velocity. We know that the slope of position versus time is velocity. Slope of a velocity versus time graph is what we call acceleration. Um, and slopes are a huge part of the work that we do when we physics. But what about when our graphs aren't straight lines? That's what I want us to think about now. Now, if we are um, finding the slope, and we've thought about like with slopeometers before, you know, like if we put our slopeometer at various points along the graph, then that tangent line, that slopeometer is showing us the slope of the tangent line. Um, and that is a nice way of thinking about like how is the slope changing? Like we can see that this curved position versus time graph the higher we go on the time axis, the further to the right we go on the graph, the steeper the graph gets. So we can see that the velocity is increasing here. Uh, but when we're thinking in general about slopes with curves, it would be nice if we could figure out like, what's the exact slope at this exact location? Like what if I wanted to know at that red dot there, what is the slope right here? So, one thing that I think we might have already done uh, in Pivot Interactives, something that works really well if I have a parabolic position versus time graph, is if I take, say, with a bunch of data points of position versus time, then if I take the first three data points, data points one, two, and three, a slope of just those three points does a pretty good job of telling me like what's the slope in the middle. So at that second data point at that value of the independent variable, what's the, what's the slope at that point? And if I take data points two, three, and four, then that average slope does a pretty good job of telling me like what's the slope in the middle. If I take data points three, four, and five, then the slope of those three points does a pretty good job of telling me what's the slope at data point number four and so on. That works really well with a parabolic graph, but what if my graph's not a parabola? You don't know that the graph on screen right now is a parabola. So what can I do as a general rule to find what is the slope at a specific point, like at this red dot here? Well, one thing that I can do is I can take two points to the left and right of that point. And I just made, uh, didn't do a great job of it, but I can make a little chord there is the, the fancy talk from one point to another. Um, and the, the two points are like equal distances to the left and to the right of that red dot where I want to know what is the slope. And you can see that the slope between those two points does a pretty good job of matching up with, like if I used a slopeometer there, it's maybe not perfect, but comes pretty close to matching up with the, the steepness at that one exact point. Now also, the further apart those data points are, if I move my data points, say, here and here, and actually I'm going to move this one on the right because something you can't see me doing is I'm just trying to get the left-right distances about the same. If I make a line between those two points, you can see they don't have the same slope as the previous 
line I made. And that is even further away from the steepness at this one point at this red dot. So if I'm using two data points that are further away from the spot that I want to know about, my results are not going to be as meaningful. And so I can get a better approximation of the slope at that red dot when I make my data points closer. If I make my data points closer to that red dot, then this chord from point to point does a better job of matching up with the exact steepness at that one exact red location where I want to know what's the slope right there. And so I'm going to get the very, very, very best. We can see it pretty well matches up, but is maybe not perfect compared to that previous one. I'm going to get the best value of the slope at the red dot when I shrink how far away those two points are. And so I want to make that delta time shrink as close to zero as I can. Now that's also going to shrink the delta x to a smaller number. I'm going to have both. And thinking about the slope, this is delta x divided by delta t. And the closer and closer and closer I bring those dots together, my two blue dots, then the smaller both the numerator and denominator, delta x and delta t, are going to be. So the individual numerator and denominator will be getting closer and closer to zero, but the ratio, the fraction delta x divided by delta t, is going to be getting closer and closer and closer to that exact value of the slope at that red dot. And that's what I want to accomplish conceptually. I want to shrink down my delta t's so small, conceptually speaking, I want to shrink down those delta t's so small that you can't even tell that they're bigger than zero, that, the, that they're not at the same point. Now, I can't actually have my denominator, delta t, be zero, but I want to shrink it down as close as I can towards zero. And in your calculus class, if you've met this concept of limits by now, which I think you will have, then I want to take the limit as delta t approaches zero without ever actually becoming zero. Because zero divided by zero for a slope isn't a very helpful thing to try to do, but I can take the limit as delta t approaches zero. Delta x is also going to be approaching zero but the ratio of delta x divided by delta t is going to be approaching that exact slope of the tangent line right at that one spot, right at that red dot, because I want the slope of the tangent line right there. So I want to shrink those down. I want to shrink down the delta t, which is then going to also make the delta x be smaller. And so conceptually, this is what I want. And knowing that the slopes of our graphs, the rates of change on our graphs are really valuable. Um, this was a puzzle that Isaac Newton and others were all trying to solve. So Isaac Newton, and we'll say Isaac Newton because he's the one that you know of right now who's most closely associated with physics, who was working on this problem, although this was something that a lot of people in the world of math were trying to do. Like, how can I figure out the exact slope of a tangent line at an exact point on my horizontal axis? I want to know the exact steepness for this one x value, for this one independent variable value and not just guessing based on what it looks like, you know, doing some careful geometry. Like there's got to be a pattern to how these slopes change. And I don't want to have to like redo this over and over and over again at every single point. There's got to be a better way is what Isaac Newton is thinking. And the, the method that he and some others came up with is something that we call a derivative. And when I talk about a derivative, I'm really just using fancy language for slope, like a slope function. Like if I have a function y of x, then there should exist some function slope of x. And that's what Isaac Newton is thinking about. And that's what we want to think about.
So like here I made on the left side of the screen, here's just a generic, I was thinking cubic when I drew it, y versus x kind of function. It starts off at the beginning. It starts off very, very like our leftmost x values. It's a very positive, very steep positive slope. So the slope is a large positive slope, and that slope is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And right here at the origin is about where we get the smallest steepness of the graph, because now when I go to larger x values past zero, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper again. So the slope was always positive, but it decreased for those negative x values to its smallest amount at the origin and then increased again. And so I've got a function then for like, what does the slope of that function look like? Then I made a graph on the lower right that shows something like that, a large positive slope that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but even at its very smallest, it's still positive and then gets larger and larger and larger again. And so Isaac Newton figured out a way that like, if I know this function y of x, then I can figure out a new function slope of x, which is pretty cool and really meaningful for physics because like slope of the function, you know, like sometimes that's velocity or for a different function, sometimes that's acceleration. Or we did tons and tons of work with slopes in honors physics one, and we're going to do plenty more. And so coming back to the world of physics, like if I have a position versus time graph, X versus T, X for position, T for time, then if I want to get velocity, then I have to take two points on my line, are not necessarily a line, but two points on my graph, and I have to, from point to point, I'm doing a delta x and a delta t, but I want to shrink down that delta t as small as possible. And I'm hopeful that by now in calculus class, you are already familiar with this, uh, the, the way that we write this, the limit, L-I-M, as delta t approaches zero, of delta x divided by delta t, that's how we define velocity. Now, a shorthand way of writing that, instead of writing the limit as delta t approaches zero of that ratio delta x over delta t, a way that we shorthand these tiny, tiny, tiny deltas, because my delta t is infinitesimally tiny. Infinitesimal means so close to zero, you couldn't tell the difference between that number and zero, but it's not zero. Um, so I've got an infinitesimally tiny delta t and an infinitesimally tiny delta x. And so a way that we shorthand write that is instead of writing out that limit, we write dx divided by dt. And dx means delta x, where the delta x is infinitesimally small. dt means delta t, where the delta t is infinitesimally small. And before somebody asks, well, can't you divide out those t, those d's, sorry. No, you can't divide out those d's because they're not numbers. Just like the deltas aren't numbers, when we look at delta x divided by delta t, we certainly don't divide out the deltas and do x divided by t. That is incorrect work. Um, because those deltas are operators. They tell us what to do. Delta x says take the two x values and subtract them. Delta t says take the two t values and subtract them. Likewise, dt means take two t values and subtract them. It's just that they're incredibly close to each other, so the difference is almost zero. So our shorthand way of writing tiny, 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 infinitesimally small delta t's and delta x's, instead of writing the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta x divided by delta t, we just write dx over dt. One other thing uh, that you are probably noticing looking at these is you see these little arrow looking shapes on top of the v's and the x's and the a's if you've looked down so far. Um, what those mean, those are just symbols that I like to use to remind me that I'm looking at a vector here that these things have direction. Position is a vector, velocity is a vector, acceleration is a vector. So we could take the same reasoning and think about acceleration. 
And thinking about acceleration as the slope of the velocity versus time graph, we could take we could think about acceleration as the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta v over delta t, which we could rewrite as acceleration equals dv divided by dt. Now, what's also true is that velocity v is dx over dt. So we could also think about acceleration as d of dx over dt over dt. Um, another way we would describe that, that's the second derivative acceleration is the second derivative of the position function, what we mean is that the acceleration is the slope of the slope of the position graph. If velocity is the rate of change of position and acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, then acceleration is telling us the rate of change of the rate of change of position, which is a difficult thing to really internalize in your brain, which is why for almost everybody who's new to learning physics, like in a first year physics course, acceleration is almost always one of the hardest ideas because we're thinking not just about how is something changes, but we're thinking about how is the change changing? And that takes some, some time to process and to think our way through. So something that you haven't heard from me at all yet though, is like, how do I actually do any of this. So we've got an idea of this derivative where I should be able to come up with a function for the slope, but I haven't shared with you anything about how to actually do it. So first I'm just going to share with you one quick pattern that you already know, and then I'm going to stop and in the next video, then we'll dig into some details. But how do I do this? The first thing that I want us all to notice is if I think about a constant acceleration, so I have my acceleration versus time graph as a straight line, sorry, a horizontal line, a constant value, then my velocity versus time graph is linear and my position versus time graph is quadratic. These are things that I would expect we already know from our first year of physics. And so the position function is a quadratic t squared kind of function. And the velocity function, the derivative of the position function, depends on t to the first power. That's a linear function. And the acceleration function depends on t to the zeroth power because something that we should remember right now is that anything to the zeroth power is 1. And so there's a pattern here. If I have a quadratic position function, then I get a linear velocity function, and I get a constant value acceleration. And there's a pattern here t to the second power, t to the first power, t to the zeroth power. There's every time I take a slope, there's a change of one in the power of the function. And that's something we're going to explore in our next video where we get into the details of how do I do a 